What do you think digital citizenship means? What we're going to be talking about today? What exactly do you think it is? <laughs> Daniel. Daniel, I'm sorry. I'm still getting that right. Sending emails and things related to that. Yes, Speak louder. Sending emails and things related to that. Great. So sending emails, anything related to that digital part. So great. So when we think about digital, we think um, emails, maybe social networks, online, stuff that we do on the computer or on a phone. Great. So digital citizenship. Now what about citizenship? What do you think when you hear the word citizenship? What do you think being a good citizen means? Uh, Jeremy, being a nice person and not doing anything bad. Yeah, being a nice person, not doing anything bad, and helping others when you can. That's usually what we think of when we hear this term, being a good citizen or citizenship. Now, what do you think this overall term means, that digital citizenship? Do you think it's possible to be a good citizen online? Yes! Great, it totally is, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. And we're also going to be talking about the sort of flip side of that, and that's when people aren't such good citizens online. And basically, if you see, um, if you think about the web, it's not all that different from our world. There are some bullies online, there are some creepy people online, and there are a lot of wonderful people and resources online, but it's really up to us to be educated, to be good citizens, and make sure we know what's what. So, you might be wondering why a 14-year-old is talking about digital citizenship. My name is Adora Stutok, and when I was seven, I published my first book, which is called Flying Fingers, Master the Tools of Learning Through the Joy of Writing. And ever since publishing my first book, I've been really interested in what I can do using online tools. So I've been writing blogs and articles and um, my own website and things like that. Um, and one of the things that I noticed after I gave this speech at a conference called TED, which is a really big conference, um, then that video received over a million views online. And with that million views came a lot of nasty comments, a lot of really nice comments, but a lot of nasty ones too. And so I had to realize that really that I can let that affect me. And I also learned an important lesson about who's out there on the web. That is that sometimes there are people who are really bored and have nothing better to do than post something mean on a video or on a blog post. And that you have to really be aware that you can't let, say, someone's words hurt you too much. So that's one of the lessons I've learned about digital citizenship. Now we're going to talk about some of your experiences. So when you post something online, it can really be seen by many people. Who do you think are some of the people who could see something you post online? Oh, uh, your teachers, your relatives, and parents, other important people. Right. A lot of important people. Your teachers, your relatives, your parents. Um, who else might see it? Like uh, uh, employer in your future. Employer in your future. Excellent. Right. Who else might see it? A, a world government. World government? Great. So, um, do any of you know about Twitter and what the Library of Congress is doing what, with tweets? Has anyone heard of that? Oh, no. Yes. Yes. Well, yes. I don't think Twitter is going to be. I didn't think that, Jason. I've, I've heard of Twitter, but I don't know what they're doing. Okay, so basically, Twitter is microblogging, so it's, it's like blogging, only it's extremely short, 124 characters. So people post things that are really short. Sometimes they post interesting things. Uh, a lot of the time they post sort of boring things, like, I just ate, or I'm so bored. It really depends on whose Twitter account you're talking about. However, whether those tweets are good or bad, the Library of Congress is now going to be archiving um, tweets from Twitter, so whatever you say could be maybe read hundreds of years from now and they'll think, wow, they had interesting ideas about what was interesting. Maybe. So when you uh, write something online, it could be seen by important people in your life, a future employer, maybe the government, um, and it could also be seen by a wide range of people who you don't know, maybe have never met, which is a little bit scary to think about. So your friends, 
can definitely see it. Your parents, your principal, um, creepy people, gangsters, the person who will be interviewing you for a job in 10 years, maybe even your future husband or wife, which is kind of crazy to think about. But that's true because when you post something online, oftentimes, if someone is working hard enough, they can go to an archiving website and find a past copy of, say, something that you posted on that website or that blog or that social network. So it's actually surprisingly easy to dig up stuff from your digital past. So think about what you post on the web as carefully as what you would write down on paper and put out in a public space because that's essentially what you're doing only to an even bigger audience. Who you are online is just as important to your future as who you are in person. So what does this mean? Who you are in person? Um, oh, and I forget. <laughs> um, who you really are instead of what you say you are? Okay, who you really are. So in person, so when I'm talking to you and you're talking to me, that's in person. Now imagine if we are on two computers instead of looking at each other. Now I could, yeah, I could pretend to be something, someone completely different. I could say, I am an 80-year-old man in Wisconsin instead of a 14-year-old girl in Seattle. And uh, yeah, so it's really easy to just say that you're someone who you're not. But in the case of what I'm saying here, who you are online is just as important in your future as who you are in person. I'm saying that the actions that you take online, so whether you're nice or mean to someone online, that's just as important as whether you're nice or mean to the person sitting next to you or at recess. So make sure that your online presence really reflects who you want to be and how you want people to think of you. So not a bully, not someone who posts really boring, uninteresting things, or doesn't use correct grammar, you want to make sure that what you post online really reflects you as a person and as a good person. You are a digital citizen and everything you do leaves a digital footprint. So as I said earlier, it's really easy to dig up stuff from your digital past if you're working hard enough. So you want to make sure that footprint is a good one. Another thing is that even if you take something down from the web, let's say that you posted a blog and it was about your family's wonderful vacation. And you realize that maybe you posted a little bit too much information about your family or um, your house or something like that, so you take it down. But the thing is that it could still exist on someone else's computer. Someone can download whatever you uploaded or copy it, send it around. Um, there's lots of examples of that. So have any of you heard of the music video Friday? Yes. You've heard that? Uh, okay, so I won't. I will spare you the torture of replaying it. <laughs> but the thing with Friday. <laughs> Friday. Okay, I can't actually reproduce. Every time I try to sing the song, my sister just says I'm a horrible singer, and I don't know if that's because of the song or that's because I have no sense of pitch. But anyhow, the thing with Friday is that it got over 150 million views because people were sending it around to each other and everyone was like, ha ha ha, look at this girl with this auto-tune singing, it sounds really bad. And so it was just, it became a phenomenon. And the amazing thing about this video, this single video, it received more views on the video than the Super Bowl does. So that's kind of crazy to think that one teenage girl in California can make a song that is heard by so many people, even if they mostly dislike it. Now the point though of that story is that that's a great example of where even though after a couple months she ended up taking it down, she re-uploaded it later, but she took it down, but that wasn't the end to the Friday thing because you can still find lots and lots of videos where people had screen, taken screenshots of Friday or they had recorded it, so there were thousands of other videos that had the Friday soundtrack or the music video. So even when she took that down for a couple months, it wasn't really uh, out of YouTube wasn't really out of where people could see it. So when you upload something, realize, unless you want it to maybe accidentally become the next Friday, maybe on a smaller scale, to make sure it's something you really are okay with existing on the web forever. So the question is, how can you use the web as an awesome social, academic, and career tool without putting yourself in danger or ruining your reputation, your online reputation? So how do we use the web positively? 
Olivia. For doing things like book reports. For doing things like book reports, great. So let's say that we have a big assignment to write a book report. How might we use the web to help us in that? To type it out and have it proofread. Okay, type it out and have it proofread, great. What are some other ways we might be able to use the web? Um, for, for looking for a book that you want to download to your iPod or something. Great, so there are examples where you could like maybe even download a book if you have something like an iPod or an iPad or a Kindle or one of those devices or maybe your parents have one and you're about to go on a trip and you think, well, maybe I'd like to take this book with me, but it's kind of heavy so you could always download it and read it digitally. Another thing is that um, there are a lot of, if the book that you're reviewing is a classic, something that was written, you know, quite a long time ago, then you could probably look it up on the Google Books Project or Project Gutenberg, which archives <coughs> classics, and then you might be able to search through the book to find interesting quotes or to make sure that you understand the plot summary. So that's something that you could do is look up information about the book online. So if you need something where, let's say you've returned the book to the library, but you still need to find out some information, maybe you forgot the author's name, you could find something like that online. So the web can be a really awesome place for doing research and for finding good content. You just have to know what is legitimate, what is going to be true information, and what might not be so reliable. So how do you know what's safe and what's not? If you're just running a search on something, so if all of you run a search before, you searched a word online. Yeah. Yes. All of you, okay, great, all of you done that. So when a list of results comes up, how do you know what is good information and what's not? Um, if it says something like nasty about the word or if it is saying something that's not true about it, then don't pick that one. It's a different one that means the word and does not say anything nasty about it. Okay, great. So if you're searching for a word, if you're searching for a place, and maybe the first result. So let's say you're searching for something about um, the city of Paris, France, and you'd like to know more about its history because you're doing a little project about France. And you search Paris, and let's say that one of the first few results that comes up is parisishorrible.net, and it has all these pictures of the worst places in Paris, and it's like, oh, Paris is really nasty, the streets aren't clean, and dogs poop everywhere, or something like that. <laughs> Would that be true? You know what's funny though, when I went to Nice, which is actually pretty far from Paris, but everywhere, dogs pooping, a little off topic. But the point is, you have that, you have that Paris is horrible.net. Would you think that that would be a good source to include for your project about France? No, probably not. So when we have a, an imaginary website like Paris, uh, Paris is horrible.net, which I just made up, we see something called bias, which means um, bias is like prejudice, so you're like strongly in favor of something or you're against it. So in this case, they're really biased against Paris. They're saying it's horrible. So you don't want to go to a website where people are showing bias. Either this is so great or this is so horrible. Now, what is a trustworthy website you might use if you wanted to find information about Paris? If it doesn't have like any like inappropriate words, that's like the thing for it, or like the for like the website. Okay, so if it doesn't have any inappropriate words, what else? Let's say we have a website that doesn't have any inappropriate words. It looks pretty good, but what else might we want to check as well? So another is Wikipedia. <laughs> okay, so you might go to Wikipedia. Well, here's the thing with Wikipedia. Um, there aren't a whole lot of errors most of the time, but the thing is that any article can be edited by anyone. So that means you or I can go and say like, oh, I want to edit this article. Click edit. And 
So because of that fact that it can be edited by anyone, what you're reading you have to take with a grain of salt. That means realize that, you know, the person next door might have just changed something. Or occasionally people will want to play tricks or, you know, be pranksters and so they'll change something on purpose to something that isn't true. And that happens a lot, like on pages about famous people or famous events that are controversial. People have different opinions on them. So try to use websites where not anyone can edit them. So like Wikipedia, anyone can edit it. And personal blogs are usually not reliable sources for, say, a research project. So if you're doing a research project and you just need to find facts, a good thing to do is search and then look for good like .gov sites. So .gov would be government or .edu would be education. And then there's also, you can make yourself a list of trustworthy sites. What are a list of sites that I think are really good? So like for instance, I like National Geographic and the BBC um, and a bunch of other sites. And so making yourself a list of these trustworthy sites will give you some websites that you can go to first. Here's a rule of thumb. If you don't know a person in real life, don't make friends with him or her on the web. So most of you probably already generally know this idea of don't talk to strangers, and it's pretty much the same online, because the number of strangers is a lot bigger. Think before you share or give out personal info, like your real name, or your home address, or even your email. So definitely a big no-no is home address. Never put your home address online because that's sort of uh, asking for trouble. Not necessarily like a huge thing, but if you put your home address, for instance, on your blog, you say, oh, I'm going on vacation, then you might come back from vacation and find that someone had taken things from your house, right? So there's always that small possibility, and you want to make sure that you're aware of that and that you're keeping yourself safe. Read privacy statements before sharing your information. Anyone know what a privacy statement is? Uh, what do you think, Matt? It's like, it, it tells you what you're, you're not allowed to do and what you can do. Right, so privacy statement is this big, like, giant thing with tiny font that basically says, yeah, what you're allowed to do, what you can't do. And it also says what they, as a company or an organization, can do with your information. So have any of you set up an email account before? Okay, so most of you have set up an email account before. Now, usually if you set up an email account and it's through like Gmail or Hotmail or one of the um, companies that would do email, then you'll see a big privacy statement. It'll say we can do this and we can't do this and you can't do this. And most of you probably didn't take the time to read all that fine print, but it's a good idea to look at privacy statements, at least look at the main ideas of them so that you know what they might do with your information. And if you see something that really doesn't seem right, like we reserve the right to sell your email address, home address, um, name, school name, and other pertinent information to any company that we want to so that they can use it for advertising purposes. Do you think that would be a good thing or a bad thing? Bad. Bad. So what do you want to essentially say? So what does this we reserve the right to sell your email address? Okay, so maybe it wouldn't be quite as clear as that. It would probably be a little bit, and the language might hide it a little more, but if they reserve the right to sell your email address and all this other information about you to other companies, what do you think would happen? Other companies would like go to your house and try to sell you something? Yeah, you might get a lot of junk mail. Have any of you seen, like, uh, maybe when you get the mail on some days, you'll get, like, a lot of advertising or catalogs that maybe nobody signed up for. Have you all had that experience? I know I have. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you've all seen junk mail in the mailbox. Well, now, also, have any of you gotten spam in your email? Oh, yes. Is that yes. what you're yes. Yeah. Right, so... Spam is like the digital equivalent of junk mail, and sometimes we get spam because we've signed up for a lot of things online, so maybe we saw, oh look, free giveaway, I'll sign up for that, and then they might take your email address, and because of their privacy statement that allows them to sell your email address to other people, other companies, then you might get a lot of junk email that you don't want. So, again, something to watch out for. 
it's always a good idea to, if you don't want to get junk mail, to make sure that whatever you're signing up for has a good privacy statement that says we are not going to sell your email, we don't share your email or other information with other companies. And more companies are realizing that that's what people want to see. So that's a good thing. Um, but it's always a good idea to read the privacy statement. Read the fine print. If there's any other stuff that at the bottom or around that's really tiny, you can bet it might be important, which is possibly why it's so tiny, because it could be something that uh, they aren't really wanting people to see. So reading the fine print is also great. And tell a trusted adult if someone online is making you uncomfortable. As I said before, the online world mirrors the real world in a lot of ways. There are bullies online. So make sure that you tell someone if um, someone is being mean or making you feel uncomfortable in any way. And don't post any information that can be traced back to you, like a uh, phone number is a definitely not something you want to post, and home address as before. So when you take all these precautions to make sure that people aren't knowing too much about you online, you can make sure that you're safe. Uh, in a so it basically comes down to common sense. What do we not want to share online? Okay. Your, pers your personal, like, um, what? Yeah. Oh, I had it and then, like, right, you're on the right path. <laughs> your, personal, your personal information, exactly. So, what does anyone want to say? What are a few of the things like personal information? Includes. So we know home address. What else? Your phone number. Your phone number. Right. What else do you not want to share with everyone? Your email address. Your email address. Right. So as we talked about before, even when you're signing up for things, you might not want to uh, always do that with your email address because you can get junk mail, and um, you definitely don't want everyone in the world to see your email address. All right. What are a few of the other things we might not want to post online? Um, your personal files and pictures sometimes. Yeah, personal files and pictures. Really good point you brought up there. Actually, this that one is you know it's like a personal files and pictures. You know, if you have your um, little document about how awesome your family is and you're writing about all the vacations you've taken and all the vacations you're going to take and look here are all these pictures of our family and we're standing in front of our house and here we are here. You know, you probably don't want to post all of that online because, as I said, anyone can see it. And so something that you only wanted some family members to see or you only wanted yourself to see, you should probably send over email or send over a way that's more secure. All right, and anything else we don't want to share online? Where you live. Where you live, right. You don't want to give uh, an, anyone an idea of where you live, especially since we're all young. And um, so, what are a few other things that you might not want to post? So we know where you live, phone number, email address, home address, personal files and pictures, anything else? Your age. Your age. Excellent one. Yes, definitely don't post your age, especially if you're like in a discussion board or you're in some place where really, again, anyone could log in and see what you're talking about. Um, don't post your age. And really, like, let's say if someone um, is asking to be your friend online and they ask how old you are, maybe it's on a discussion board or something like that, you don't need to tell them because if there's someone that you know in real life, they really should know how old you are or it shouldn't matter too much. So, yeah, don't post your age. Great. And one or two more things, everyone? Your schedule or what are you doing every day? Excellent. Your schedule, what you're doing every day, never a good idea to post on a blog or a website, say, oh look, at 8 a.m. I walk to school, at 9 a.m. I'm eating breakfast. You know, that's really not ever a good idea because, um, you know, you don't want anyone to follow you, right? And again, small percentage of that happening, but you want to protect yourself as much as you can. Great. So, schedule, specific plans, personal photographs. We've gotten that. Oh, and another thing is when you're um, in, in any kind of setting online where you don't know people or where there are strangers involved, don't post your real name or use a username that includes your full name. So, for instance, my name, Adora Svitov, um, you, if I were on a, say, a discussion board or a chat room where I didn't know anybody 
I was talking to, I wouldn't say what my full name was or, you know, where I live, anything like that. So, really use common sense. If you follow basic safety rules like that and learn how to spot gestures, the internet can provide amazing photographs, source documents, and like journal entries and letters. So does anyone know what I mean when I say source documents? Like a source that you use like under a computer file or whatever? So a source that I use um, a source document is something that I would use, say, in a research project or a homework assignment. When we talk about sources, and especially as you move on up to middle school and high school, you'll be doing a lot of work where you have to look up sources to say, oh, I went to this website or I looked at this book in order to find information for my project. So that's what I mean with a source document. It's just a place that you go to find information. So a source document could be like a journal entry from, uh, if you're studying the Civil War, maybe you go back and you find um, something that a soldier in the Civil War had written in his journal, or a letter between a soldier and, um, and his kids or something like that. So these would be amazing source documents, and you can find many such things online. Treasure troves of accurate information, as long as you know where to look, can be found on the internet. So. Here are a few of, I talked earlier about how it's a good idea for all of us to make a list of websites that we trust so we know where to go when we have a homework assignment. So for instance, I like pbs.org, uh, as well as the BBC. The Library of Congress.gov, loc.gov, can provide a lot of those wonderful photographs and source documents. And National Geographic, Discovery Channel, a lot of the um, channels are um, like History and Discovery, National Geographic. Time Magazine, they all have websites that can have really good information. So if you need help, say, making this list of trustworthy websites, you could ask your parents to recommend one or two that they like as well. And then next time you have something where you need to look up good information, you can go to one of these as well as books. Websites created by organizations or people that are unfamiliar to you are questionable. So you go to a website and you've never heard of it before, you've never been on it before, but you think, hmm, I might use this for my research project. What do you want to do? You want to make sure that you understand who set up the website and maybe why they set up the website. So for instance, let's remember our little imaginary website, parisishorrible.net. So it's a good idea to think, hmm, I wonder why these people would set up this website. So I, maybe I would go to the about part of the website and it would say, Paris'sHorrible.net was created by a couple who had a horrible experience traveling to Paris last year and went to tell the world about how terrible their experience was. So now I'm thinking, okay, this Paris'sHorrible.net, I mean, already we know it's not really a trustworthy source because of what it's called, but we also know that the people who set it up aren't experts on Paris. So when we go to a website, let's make sure that the people who set it up are really um, knowledgeable and understand what they're talking about. And some people actually create hoax websites. Anyone know what a hoax is? Uh, a trick. I'm sorry? A trick. A trick. a trick? Yeah, a hoax is basically a trick. Great. So a hoax website is a website that's created to give false information or to make fun of something. A hoax website basically tricks the people who look at it. So we're going to take a look at a website that is um, an example of, I won't say whether it's a hoax or not, you can see for yourself what you think of it. So we're going to practice with evaluating this website. Can you see what's on the board? Okay, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Alright, yes. so this is this website, it's called Boilerplate of Soldier, and it says the mechanical man participated in most of the conflicts of its age, either as observer or as combatant. So what does that mean, that sentence that he participated in these conflicts as observer or combatant? Jeremy? He um helped out with the he helped out with what was happening in that time. Okay, he helped out with what was happening in that time. So either he saw it with his eyes or he was actually fighting. If you're a combatant, that means you're like a soldier. 
1898, the Spanish-American War, and here's boilerplate with Teddy Roosevelt, and 1904, the Japanese-Russian War, and here's boilerplate with this group of soldiers, right? So, 19, 1898, 1904, there's this awesome little mechanical man, and he's able to shoot and walk and see things, and uh, look, World War I, boilerplate in World War I, and boilerplate vanishes. Alright, so what do you guys think of this website? It's fake. It's fake. Great. That's basically the point that you should have seen. Um, now, I heard some of you say it's awesome, which is sort of my reaction at first. And when I first saw this website, I will be honest, for a second I thought, whoa, there's this cool robot and I had no idea about it. Um, but then I realized, okay, there's no way that this, this robot or this mechanical man could have like posed next to Teddy Roosevelt. Even if you aren't familiar with some of the wars that it talks about, you should know that it's a fake website. Why? Because it has fake stuff about it and what happened at that time. Right, that's fake stuff about it. So, um, let's say you don't know that much about the Spanish-American War, but you know that there wasn't something like this in 1898. So you can think, okay, if one thing is false or if one thing is implausible, unlikely, then that means that the whole website uh, likely is a bit questionable. And that's a good rule of thumb when you go and you are looking at an unfamiliar website. If you find one or two things that stands out as, wow, that's really wrong or that doesn't make sense, then you might want to question the website <coughs> Now in this case, this boilerplate uh, soldier website is a hoax website just set up by someone for fun, but it looks fairly legitimate. Like if you were just looking at it, um, say for a historical project, you might think, whoa, this is such an awesome website with all these different pictures of this mechanical dude and all these different wars. So uh, remember that even a fairly decent looking website may have errors or might be a hoax all the So most of the websites that you go to are not hoax websites, but it's always a good idea to think, what can we learn from the experience of having gone on one of those hoax websites? What makes them a little different? So why do you think someone would create a hoax website like that? Someone is either really negative, 
I hate Justin Bieber, or really positive, I love Justin Bieber, because in either case, you might find some information that's not true. All right, so thinking about purposes the websites are created for. Whenever you're doing a research project, you want to go to the websites that have the purposes that match yours. So if your purpose is, I want to look for information, then you want to go to a website whose purpose is, I want to give information. If you're looking for information, you don't want to go to a website whose purpose is, I want to make everybody hate the thing I'm talking about. You know? So, go to websites that, whose purpose is match yours. And before you can use information from a website in a school project, make sure that the website is reputable. Anyone know what reputable means? Um, uh, Levi. Right. I'm sorry? Something that, like, you can trust, or something that will tell you the right information. Very good. Reputable. Something that you can trust, something that will tell you the right information. So, you can go back to your list of trustworthy websites, or you can evaluate it. You can look at things like, who is, it, who is this website made by? Why was this website made? What is it for? And is, the, is all the information I see on here correct? So you might want to go to a few different websites and make sure that the information on one website you also see in another website and another website. So, when you're running a search or when you're online, what are some of the tips that we can take away? What are some of the things you'll do now? Oh, sorry. They won't let you, like, they won't let you do certain things, like, they won't let you um, post really, really nasty things, and they could, like, take your computer or whatever that you're using away. Alright, so if you post something really, really nasty online, then yeah, there are people who will see it. So maybe your parents would see it, and your parents could be like, hey, you're not using the computer anymore, and you're grounded, by the way. Or maybe your teacher or principal could see it, and they'll be like, hey, that language, even though you're not in school, it isn't appropriate to use, even outside of school. So there are definitely examples, actually, where that's happened. Um, maybe some of you've heard in the news, like some kids who were on Facebook created a website and it was all about, oh, we don't like our principal, and it said nasty things about their principal. And as a result, they got punished in school because it was something that they said about school. So realizing that what you post online can be seen by your parents, can be seen by your teacher's or principal, it can be seen by almost pretty much anyone who has a computer and internet access. So we know what not to do. We talk about what personal information we don't share. What about when we're trying to find information for a school project? How can we make sure that our information is good? Um, to keep it positive and not negative. And make sure it is positive and not negative. Okay, to so make sure it is positive and not negative. Great, so what we're ideally looking for is actually something like right in between the positive and the negative. So, because there's there's the possibility that we could also find some information that's false. There's a website called ilovepariso-much.net. On ilovepariso-much.net, you might not find anything about some of the problems with Paris. However, on ihateparis.net, you'll find um, nothing about the good side. So you want to make sure that you're looking for something that has aspects of both good and bad. It provides a balanced approach, if you can, or at least it's neutral. And um, so when you're looking for information, evaluate the websites you're going to, you set it up, and anything else you're going to do when you're running a search. One more. Can you repeat that again? Sure. What is another thing you're going to do? Sorry. Can you repeat that again? Sure. One more thing. So when you're running a search, what is one more thing you might do to make sure your information is good? website or something? Good, great. Always go to the result if you need recommendations or if you need to be evaluated. Great, I think you guys are well on your way to being awesome digital citizens, so thank you so much. I've enjoyed talking with you and I hope you have happy searches. Okay.